as you know, we're all here today to talk about the introduction of our Beacon Series. And I think it's very important that we tell the story of Tennessee Bank and Trust in that it is a privately owned bank with offices in Green Hills and Cool Springs. And that our bank was established in 1908. And so we've been serving our customers for over 100 years. We're going to be pleased to present the Beacon Series aimed at helping businesses become more successful. And we're going to be taking our customers and some non-customers, uh, relaying their business experience, the good and the bad that they've had, reflect on what they've done right, what they could have done better, and share those experiences with our customers, our business customers, and with our bankers, uh, so that we may all learn how to benefit each other. Uh, my name is Dan Andrews. I am the Tennessee Market President for Tennessee Bank and Trust. And today is the first session in a series of sessions uh, by Tennessee Bank and Trust on the Beacon Series on Business. And what we wanted to do was to go out and find the best um, business people we could find, bring them all together in one place, and then let you all talk about your views, your concepts, your best practices, your successes, take that information and then share it with the community. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to meet Dr. Halbert about three years ago when he gave a, uh, he gave a presentation on uh, effective CEO communications. And you can tell when the seminar is smoking is when everybody's taking notes. And 45 seconds into his session, the, he had the complete attention of the, of the crowd and I'd like to introduce Dr. Bill Halbert. He'll talk today on how to build winning relationships. Good morning. It is good so morning. good to be here with yeah. you. And dealing with people is a challenge. Anybody work with people? You have people, you, have, you notice it is a challenge. And I even put some of the more challenging people in your handout. If you'll open that handout on page uh, one there, you'll see some of the people we work with. And I will just play with that a little bit to kind of get a, a feel for who are these people that we work with. See if you see one that stands out. Anybody got one that just stands out in your mind as a critical issue? I, I'll hear from Tom. Tom, you're wagging your head pretty severely there. You've apparently got somebody there in mind. Who, who would it be? Give us the list. A jump to conclusion. A jump to conclusion person. Give me another one. What, what's a person that gives you an issue here? You got Certain, one there? Uh, one? Liars. Just really, a pure liar. Well, it, I, I don't know if it's more of a character issue. I mean, you've got to have truth and yeah. trust to build yeah. any organization. So I think liars is sort of a... Sort yeah, of yeah. Of They're obviously not from Tennessee. <laughs> obviously. I mean, we won't point in the direction of where that state's located, but we all know it starts with a... I won't even do that. <laughs> But yeah, that's a difficult person to work with. I was talking to a president of a big company some time ago, and I was interviewing him before his staff. And I said, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions, a lot like I would do if, uh, if we were on television. And so the first question is, uh, what is it you really don't like for any of your people to ever do? And he said, I'll tell you without any hesitation. I want people to tell me the truth. I don't want anybody to lie to me. As bad as it may be, come to me with the truth. Don't come in and, and uh, waffle around or hide it or make me have to find it some other way. Come at me with the truth. So I think that's a big one. I think that one really stands out. Another one, let me hear from you. Which one rings your bell? People you, who don't take ownership. Don't take, what, now talk to me, Maggie. What, what does that mean? They don't take ownership. What are they not doing? Uh, they're not taking responsibility. They're assuming that other people are responsible for an outcome. Um, they're possibly living on an island. Uh, yeah. They don't understand it's a group decision and everybody's got to be going towards the same goal to achieve it. 
Right, right. And you can tell the difference. You can tell the difference. We hired a, a young lady to work in my organization some time ago, and, and the first day she was there, she began to do some things that uh, she had not been asked to do. Uh, she took initiative. Uh, it was initiative under control, by the way. Initiative out of control is a dangerous thing. You don't want somebody to come in on their first day and reorganize a building. I mean, you can tell them where initiative is appropriate. Well, what about anybody else? Shannon, will you, did, is there one there that's just kind of ringing your... Always right, know-it-alls. I'm always <laughs> right, know-it-all. <laughs> that is a delightful person to work with. I mean, absolutely, they, they know the answer. Come on around, David. You got one to Secretive. put... Secretive. Secretive. What does that do? What does that mean? What does that imply? It's like they're talking behind your back. They're, they're trying to put a plan together without you knowing about it. Before yeah. You yeah. Who did I miss? I get everybody right. I want to get you all too. The, the you folks at the bank. Uh, people that don't share information. Yeah. Yeah. You know when you when you do your thing, and you're a professional, you have to learn to mask some of those things. You got to be a professional. A professional is a person who can act happy and show that happiness even when they don't feel it. An amateur is a person that couldn't show it even if they did feel like it. So give me a professional any day that can mask the problems, the difficulties, and then come on out as a leader. Uh, it does seem that we have a great deal of power in working with people. And if we understand our power, if we understand how to use power, with people, then we are able to succeed much beyond we things we ever thought about doing. And I like to bring executives together like we are today because uh, we'll, we'll hear some tips today. I suggest, as is mentioned that, that there are two reasons why people work diligently. One is fear and one is respect. Uh, when fear dominates an organization, what happens? Talk to me if you would. People shut down. People shut down. What else happens? Sometimes they're afraid to tell the truth. They're afraid to tell the truth. And maybe that's the reason why we have this liar on our previous list. It was Deming, Edwards Deming, the father of total quality management, who said, drive out the fear. He said, if you really want to have an organization that maximizes the competencies of your people, think about where the fear factor is and drive it out. Because right now it's crippling you. It's keeping people from being effective. It's, it's causing folks not to do what they're capable of doing. And, and you may see them leave your organization, go somewhere else, and one day and you'll see them operating in an entirely different way. And you'll think, what in the world? How did that person change? Well, it's a different culture. Over there, it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to be free, to speak up, to be valued as a person, to disagree without being disagreeable, to uh, talk about things that might be controversial, to bring in opinions that uh, would have been previously uh, overwhelmed. I went into an organization and when I got to the uh, front door, there was glass on the door, I was going to go in a little window, kind of like at a ticket booth, and I knocked on the door, a young lady came to the door and she said, yes. And I thought, well, this is quiet, they're keeping everything quiet. <laughs> And I said, I'm here to see so-and-so. I started talking quiet. And she said, just a minute, have a seat. And I thought, well, you're doing something that re requires quietness right now. You know, this is a secretive moment or something. And I sat down and there was no magazine. There was nothing, just me. And I got real quiet, looked at the fake plants for a while. After a moment or so, she came back. She said, he can see you now. And I thought, okay. <laughs> so I opened the door, walked through this corridor of all these junior walls, everybody quiet, everybody looking down. Later on, I was talking with someone that had invited me to come to that organization and possibly work with them. And this individual said, now you can see the reason we need your help. And I said, really, is it like that all the time? He said, all day long. People are scared. And I even went into their board meeting. It was the same way. Guess who did the talking? 
the president, the one person who was in charge. Nobody had a contribution to make. There were no questions. There were only answers like, yes, sir, I will. And, and so, you know, there was obedience was the name of the game. Boy, you can tell a lot about a company by the culture, uh, by the openness with which people talk. You might think that obedience drives higher output. It does not. It actually works the opposite way. There, there are studies now that help us to realize that when we can get people to be freed up and to talk and to give their opinions and to feel like they are valued uh, at every level of the organization, that the synergy is far greater. So that's got to happen. Now, how do you do that? I think you do it with respect. I think respect is the way you do it. The, the two ways that, that respect works come under the heading of feedback. And it's, it's the tool that you and I take to work every day. Every day we get out of our car and, and we may or may not have our briefcase. We may or may not have our, our iPad, our phone, but you got your brain and you got your mouth and you've got the ability to speak to people that you come in contact with. And I would assert to you, those words that you will be using in contact with your people are the most important tools you will ever use. They are the tools that change behavior. They come under two headings. The first heading, some people refer to it as, as uh, uh, affirmation, but it's, it's praise. When I meet you, when I talk to you, when I interact with you, I have an impression on you and you on me. Something's going to happen as we talk to each other. I'm either going to feel like you like me and I like you, or I'm going to feel like, well, I didn't like him or I was about Why? Well, all he did was talk about himself. But think about your own behavior. Think about your own behavior. Did you, in fact, affirm Praise, appreciate, value the people that you talk to, or were you so busy talking about yourself and interacting with yourself and reminding yourself that you are who you are and how valuable you are? Now, Dale Carnegie, if you're taking notes, you might want to put that name down, is the father, mother, who wrote the Bible on all of this. So if you haven't read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, you've missed a major part of your life. He refers to this as the, same, as the famous MFFI principle. Have you ever heard that? M M F I. So what does that stand for? Make me for? feel important. You got, did you know that or did I have you set up? Me. All right, okay. Make me feel important. Dale Carnegie says, when you meet people, affirm them by making them feel important. And the way you do that is asking them questions. My favorite phrase, tell me about that. People will start to tell you something, and it's so easy to say, well, tell me about that. Well, talk to me more. Well, I want to hear about that. In so doing, you are praising, affirming the other person. You're making them feel valuable, and guess what that does? Anybody want to guess what that does? You become more valuable. I become more valuable, and I do it indirectly. I don't go into it with that as the objective. That's not my plan, and you can tell the difference. You can truly tell where somebody is asking questions uh, in, in such a way the, to be placating. Well, tell me about you, Shannon, you, you little person, you, down there in that little chair. And, you know, and uh, surely you haven't done a lot. You know, I mean, you, you, it's not that. You're not, you're not placating you're, or, or, or talking down to somebody. You're praising them. What do you think makes praise really valuable? When it's sincere. So, say it again. When it's sincere. How do you know it's sincere? It's a gut feeling. Okay. Stay with that one for a minute. How do you know it's sincere? When it's specific to, to something someone's done. Yeah. When it's specific to something somebody has actually done. Oh, yeah. How do you know... How do you know praise is effective? How do you how do you get the biggest punch for praise? And you do it when it occurs. Yeah. Rather than when it occurs. Right. 
you know, it's February, it's time for annual reviews. You know, I, it seemed to me, I, it would be, if I'm keeping notes, I, it would be a great time to say, Jack, let me just comment here. I noticed last February you did something a year ago where it's almost the anniversary. And it's just, I like it, and I just wanted to let you know, I personally value that. How is it? Old news. Old news. Old yeah, news. forgotten. What difference does it make, David? Well, it's not. You don't get the immediate motivation <laughs> because the time's different. I mean... It's in the past. Some people refer to that as a performance review, and they talk about performance at, at a time when performance really needs to be addressed on the spot, in close proximity, as fast as you can get to them. As fast as you can get to them. And timeliness may be one of the biggest things. It just may stand out, perhaps, Bigger, better, more than anything else that, that we would put on the list. It needs to be specific, for sure. It needs to be separated from negative. Have you ever gotten a statement of praise where, I want to just say this to you. This is something you hear sometimes. You did such a good job. Oh, yes. oh did you hear that word? Let's say it together. You did such a good job. But. Yeah. Now hear this. Everything before the word but is forgotten. So when you put those two together, negative and positive together, the negative is so strong, it wipes out the positive. The message that they hear is negativity every single time. You talk about a discipline. I'm going to give you one right now. A discipline. When you give somebody a positive comment, stop there. It's tough to do. You will find yourself saying, yeah, but there's some things I've got to say. But on the other hand, I didn't let, but don't we want to get into, uh, but I left off the, yeah, you did. You did. There are things you will not say right then. That's a, that's a mixed message. When we get mixed messages, guess which one is we're more inclined to go with? Negative. negative. We'll go with negative every single time. We will, go, we will go with negative. And you know why? Anybody have an idea why? You want approval. Keep going. Well, approval from the one who's given the negative message. That's right. You want to make them happy. You want approval. You want to make them happy. Yeah. And you know, you know the, the, the single biggest deterrent for happy marriages? Would you like to guess what it is? It's criticism. Nobody likes it. Even when it's, uh, Bill, it's attempted to be done constructive, it's still something that's hard to hear. Well, we got to talk about that. And you have just fallen right into my next point. Thank you. You've got to make sure that what comes from your mouth that we call constructive criticism is, in fact, just that. Now, I use a different word, redirection. Redirection is a better word than, than criticism. Criticism implies that you've done something and now I need to critique it. And redirection has an entirely different uh, viewpoint. Um, one second here. I've just had a call. This is so embarrassing. Uh, you hate to answer a call, but I'm going to do that just a second. Or, will you indulge me? Okay. You are doing a good job. <laughs> well, isn't that something? Thank you. <laughs> isn't that neat? It's called praise. Isn't it funny? We like praise anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances. There's no inappropriate time or place for, for praise. You can stop somebody in the middle of a, of a birth and say, can I just make a comment about the doctor and his job? You know? I mean, it's, it's really truthful. Now, on the other hand, I just got another call here. Don't forget to tell them that we would like to work with them sometime in the future. <laughs> now that's something else. That's called redirection. That's redirection. Let's look at the difference between praise and redirection. Here's a good way to examine it. Time moving this way. And here's an event or a job 
that we're requiring, a job to be done. Now to begin with, there are three places that I can give feedback, talk, praise and affirm this, this job, this person doing this job. One is before, one is during, and the third is after. Okay, you help me if you will. Everybody take a spot. Where would you say the best praise is given for this job? One, two, or three? Two. Two? two? One. I say one. One? Tom? Did you say one? One. Tom, how could you praise them? They haven't done it. I want to praise them into doing a good job. I want to praise and be active with them on the front end so we set it up for success. That's your most powerful time. Feels good to get it out here, but it won't affect this job. Guess where most people give most of their praise? One, two, or three. Let me hear it. Three. 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 After it's over. Most people give their praise when it's done. It has no effect. From a statistical point of view, if you've done any research, it's called the null effect. There's no effect to give praise to somebody after they do a job right here. Isn't that a learning tool? Now you've learned something here. Now how do I get praise from a group of people here or here like today? How would that happen? Interaction. Interactions, praise. The fact that you just answered a question, the fact that you jumped in, the fact that you took a risk, the fact that you offered an idea, that's praise. That says you value me and what we're doing enough that I'll throw my hat in the ring and I'll help out. That's a way to do it. All right, let's look at another timeline. This timeline has to do with critiquing. Here's another job. This is job A. This is job B. Three places we can critique or we can redirect, we can redirect performance. One is before the job, second is during the job, and the third is after the job. Tell me, first of all, where most people, be totally honest, give most of their critique, most of their criticism, most of their feedback that would be negative to somebody who does, in fact, a job. Is it before? Is it during? Is it after? What do you think? After. I'd say after. Would you, would you all agree to that, or would somebody say no? D would everybody say that? Well, you might say on the outset, don't screw this one up like you did last time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's a possibility. <laughs> Don't do the same bad job you've always done. You know, yeah. But it does seem you're right. That most of the feedback that leaders give people, I mean, the motivating words we give people. You come to work to motivate people, to excite them, to energize them, to get them to work as hard as they possibly can. And the one tool you have that is always with you, which is your mouth, your feedback, we give it at the wrong time. After the game is over. It's over. It doesn't really count. What about in the two position? Is it okay there? Is it okay to give feedback of a redirection to people as they're in the middle of a job? I think so. I think you're right. And we call that in delegating checkpoints. Checkpoints. And there can be many checkpoints where you're getting together, where you're studying. Uh, right, we did this. We had, we've had, you all don't know this, but we prepared for you all to be uh, here today. We had meeting after meeting after meeting. And it always accompanied a nice lunch. So we want more meetings even <laughs> after this is over. And uh, so, but we would get up here and we would talk about things we got to do and look at the list. And Roddy would have a things to do list. He always had it well prepared and he knew where he wanted, knew where he was trying to go. He knew what the bank wanted. But, but that's what checkpoints do. And they allow you to be successful. Had we not had the checkpoints, 
you would be sitting here and Shannon would be leading this meeting right now. And it might be a lot better. I don't know, Shannon. I don't know. You may have done this kind of thing. I don't know. But, but in truth, that's how you move to a winning situation. That's how you create win. It, now, Bill, is it best done in stage two as opposed to stage one like the praise is best done in stage one? Got that, the redirect is that better? Than well, actually, two? what happens is when when praise is given in stage one and redirection is also in stage one, you're really marrying those two, and it takes on a new yeah. word. And I want to teach you this word if you've not heard the word before. It's called pre-calling. Pre-calling, and all of a sudden you become a pre-call feedback person. It's ironic that feedback seems to imply after the fact, but it's really before the fact. And the best leaders know how to talk to their team before they go onto the field, as opposed to even during the quarter, the timeout, the halftime, and certainly at the end of the game. If you want to be known as a good speech giver, learn to give your speeches before the team plays, not after the team played. A good friend of mine had a daughter that played on this basketball team. Well, here's what happens. After all the games, the girls go back to the locker room and the coach spends about 30 to 40, maybe even up to an hour, going around the room chewing out each girl and telling one on one each girl in the locker room how bad they played, what they messed up on, what they didn't do, where they met, where they were uh, in, uh, inadequate, what they had to change, and, and what had to occur before the next game. And I said, well, Lisa, how does that make you feel? How do you, how do you handle that? She said, Bill, we just ignore it. Mm. Wouldn't it be terrible to be a leader that's just ignored because you picked the wrong time and the wrong way and the wrong technique to talk to people and interact with people? I said, you, you ignore it? And she said, we're a great team in spite of our coach. Mm. Feedback and redirection have to be given. You can't not give it. The worst kind of leaders are those that think they can just glad hand and affirm and pat folks on the back all the time. You can't do that. If I'm working for you, I'm expecting you to invest in me. I hope that after a period of three, six, four weeks, months, a year, that I will be a stronger person for having worked with you. And I use the term work with you as opposed to work for you. I'm hoping that you will take the time to redirect me and show me some things I can do better and tell me in such a way that I'm turned on so that I can turn back to you and say, thanks, I needed that. You will have to give both, but err on the side of praise. Err on the side of praise. Be known as a leader that if I'm going to do both, and I've got to, I want to do far more praise than I do redirection. It's not the end, but it's the beginning. And the beginning comes when we really do understand the power we have as leaders, top leaders, top executives, modeling, showing other people how this can be done. It's a simple tool. It's ours for the taking. Good luck. Thank you so much.